Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good evening and welcome to the special focus. A lot has been happening around the world since we last connected. One of the stories people are talking about is government's plans to put a process in a uh, place to expunge criminal records people have messed their names with uh, as a result of breaking coronavirus lockdown laws. Uh, but it has no intention to do so anytime soon, and especially not during the current second wave. Uh, the Justice Department has said that South Africans need a proper deterrent to convince them to obey laws uh, and just paying for a fine doesn't, uh, it, it's not going to cut it. Uh, now, here's why this bothers many people. Criminal records attained from breaking lockdown laws persist for 10 years and uh, prevent you from getting a job and traveling to some countries. So many people have now gotten their hands dirty simply by doing what would have previously been innocent, uh, like a walk on the beach or a drive after 9 p.m. And here's another rather disheartening story also coming out from South Africa. Uh, now, two senior SAPS officials who were in charge of investigating and suspending the crime intelligence head over PPE tender irregularities uh, are now themselves being investigated for being part of the 200 million rand PPE tender corruption that has plagued the SAPS uh, during the pandemic. Uh, it is alleged that the officials were in charge when various PPE contracts were signed with brokers, uh, not suppliers, just days after the relief was announced. So this is another story pointing to the bigger issue of corruption that has caused rot across institutions in the country, especially within government and other state institutions. Uh, and then the latest What Worries the World report from a global polling form, uh, Ipsos, uh, shows that South Africans have other concerns besides the, just the coronavirus pandemic. We seem to be uh, far more concerned with rising unemployment, violent crime and government uh, corruption, with COVID-19 falling to the bottom of the list of things stressing us out uh, in this particular report. Uh, in the US right now, uh, interesting, uh, at the moment, uh, President Joey Biden having been uh, inaugurated uh, at this stage. And I remember last week we were discussing this and uh, the, in, uh, the impeachment process was actually taking place for uh, former President Donald Trump uh, last week as we were speaking. So uh, it's, uh, it's a changed world since we've last uh, spoken. And I do want to hear your thoughts on these and other stories. I am Zahi Jarrett and I'm your host until 9 p.m. Uh, please do feel free to share your comments and input via our WhatsApp line or leave a comment comment below our Facebook and YouTube live broadcast. Alternatively, you may want to tweet and tag at Salah Media, and please don't forget to use the hashtag, the special focus. We'll take an ad break now, and when we get back, we discuss the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and the African Continental Free Trade Area. Please do stay tuned. Breaking stereotypes, moving boundaries, joining hands. Salam Media. <laughs> Humanity sets the agenda. There are an estimate of 153 million orphans worldwide. Change their lives by donating towards our Orphan Kind program. For 750 Rand per month, you can be the reason an orphan smiles. Go on, be Orphan Kind. Visit www.pennyappeal.org.za or call 031-1100-573 to find out how you can help save these children's lives. Penny Appeal. Small change, big difference. With Delight's range of cooking oil, spreads, rice, and mace meal, you'll be dishing out the most delightful dishes every day. Delight. Try today. Delight is delightful. From the townships of South Africa, the refugee camps in Syria, or orphanages in Yemen, the eyes of the needy speak volumes with just one glare. We know what it's like to be at Ground Zero, with food essentials, clothing, and blankets, fresh water portal trucks, and even on-site navigators. We use every cent to better their tomorrow. Become part of our journey to bring relief to all. Go to www.ashrafulaid.org or call us on 011-809-8181. Ashraful Aid, under the auspices of Maulana Suhail Wadi. <laughs> Breaking stereotypes, moving boundaries, joining hands. Salam Media. <laughs> Humanity sets the agenda.
Welcome back. Yes, indeed, you are tuned into Salah Media. This is the special focus. I am Zahid Jadud, and we are together until 8 p.m. this evening, of course, via the audio stream, uh, salahmedia.com forward slash listen dash live via our YouTube and Facebook live broadcast as well. Thank you so much for tuning in this evening. I do hope you enjoy the show. Uh, now, the largest free trade area in the world, the African continental free trade area, began trading on the 1st of January 2021 and is expected to speed up the recovery of the continent and enhance its resilience by increasing the level of intra-African trade in goods and services. However, no goods have yet been exported or imported under its zero or reduced import tariffs because all the necessary red tape has not yet been cleared away by all member states. Tonight, we find out what this historic African continental free trade agreement means for Africa, a continent with so much to offer yet hardly any benefits, any benefits being reaped. Our guest this evening, firstly, let me welcome uh, Sister Hamid Didat, who is the Acting Executive Director at the National Labor and Economic Development Institute. Uh, she's also a civil society activist. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, Hamida. Good evening and welcome to the show. Wa alaikum assalam warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and shukran for having me. We are also joined by Chris Hatting, who is a project manager at the Free Market Foundation. Uh, good evening to you and welcome to the show. Uh, salam Zahid and salam to all the listeners. Thank you for having me on. Well, like, and uh, we are also joined by Mialanim Kabela, who is an economist uh, and the founding director, at, uh, and he's also the CEO at Ansuisa Transaction Advisory Services. Uh, good evening and welcome back to the show, sir. <laughs> Mr. Mialanim Kabela, can you hear us? All right, uh, the connection with uh, Mr. Milanim Kabela seems to be a bit uh, unsteady at the moment. Uh, we'll try to get a better connection, but in the meantime, we'll begin with you, Chris. Uh, so for the, the, the average person listening and perhaps watching uh, the show this evening, uh, forget all the research that I've done personally on my behalf. Uh, what exactly is the African Continental Free Trade Agreement? So in a broad, uh, broad strokes, if I can put it that way, I guess in a broad nutshell, the agreement I think points to a very positive direction for Africa because for centuries economic freedoms in South Africa have been suppressed, whether that was through, uh, sorry, through Africa, whether that was through colonial powers in South Africa, through the apartheid government in the rest of Africa, through other regimes. So economic freedoms have been generally suppressed. Now the free trade area is a move in the direction of allowing a lot more economic freedom, for example, lowering tariffs. Um, eliminating non-tariff barriers to trade, stuff like uh, transport costs, fuel costs, that kind of thing, government red tape and regulations. So basically, it's an agreement between African countries, African signatories, all part of the African Union. As far as I recall, um, the last time I read up on it, uh, 54 of the 55 African Un Union member states had uh, signed on to the agreement. So in a broad nutshell, it's an agreement to lower trade restrictions and to allow for a lot more intra-African trade and to hopefully set up Africa in a much stronger position to trade manufactured goods with the rest of the world. As we know, uh, Africa is often has at a disadvantage in terms of manufactured goods. So hopefully the Africa Free Trade Agreement will be uh, at least one step in that uh, positive direction. All right. So Chris sees this as a, a step in a positive direction, uh, you know, seeing that Africa has uh, has uh, economic freedoms in Africa have been suppressed over time, uh, over the course of history. Uh, Hamida, as a civil society uh, activist, uh, what are your thoughts on the uh, on this uh, agreement? OK, so thank you very much for the opportunity. So the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement has a history, so it didn't just emerge um, out of nowhere. So um, if we go back to uh, a couple of years ago when Thabo Mbeki was the president of South Africa, he tried to implement um, something called NEPAD. Um, for those of us who were quite skeptical, we referred to, it, referred to it as NEPAD. But it was also an attempt to try and facilitate trade between different African countries um, with the hope of actually moving towards um, a sense of pan-Africanism, trying to build uh, a diff an alternative uh, trading system, but it was within the the current globalization uh, framework that we currently have. 
we then also had, apart from the African Continental Free Trade Agreement having come into effect, what you have is a global trading system under the auspices of the World Trade Organization. And this is a multilateral trading system which allows countries to trade with each other. Now, historically, from 1994, for, formerly in 1995, when the WTO was formed, we know that, and for those of us who studied things in relation to international trade, the, the trade relations and the power relations within the multilateral trading system has always been to the South and the developing countries' disadvantage. And despite the fact that there's been trade facilitation, there's been issues around technical barriers and non-technical barriers to trade, there's been issues around subsidies, there's been issues around um, uh, uh, um, for sanitary and sanitary, sorry, sanitary and fossil sanitary measures in terms of how you trade, subsidies for agriculture versus um, Africa not being able to give subsidies. So there's been a whole lot of um, key issues. And eventually, when the African countries or developing countries in particular realize that colonialism is actually being perpetu perpetuated through a multilateral trading system um, advanced by the WTO there was quite a lot of resistance. And since the, the, the various rounds, I think in Washington, then Cancun, and then subsequent WTO round, what had happened is that the multilateral trading system, so the global trading system, as a result of its being, it being such an unfair system, has start, was starting to collapse. Now, while this was happening, a lot of countries who recognized, as obviously when, when you want to strike a deal and you're not able to, to, to get that deal within a, a multilateral trading system, they decided to do what you call bilaterals. So one of the key bilaterals that was specifically focused on Africa was the economic partnerships for Africa. Um, we've got the US that has the Cotonou, uh, sorry, um, what's the, I will come back, to, I'm, I'm, trying, I'm, trying, I'm trying to remember and maybe uh, Chris can help me. The, um, the, 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 the American agreement with, with, with uh, I mean, South Africa is also part of it. So there's a specific agreement that South Africa has with America, and then you had the EU wanting to have a bilateral agreement called EPAs. Now, when you go bilateral, unfortunately, any bilateral agreement and any kind of concessions that you give within a bilateral system, you eventually have to give under the multilateral system. But again, the power relations within this multilateral system is not to the advantage of developing countries. And as a result, many of us from the South, across the globe, started to contest. How the mm -hmm. African Continental Free Trade Agreement then came about was precisely because we managed to, ten, I think it's about 13 years ago, we had such a strong pushback against the EPAs that mm -hmm. when all your global system started to get worse and capitalism found itself in a worse crisis, and obviously we know the history of developing countries where our, our leaders unfortunately tend not to act in the interest of its people, but rather in the interest of, 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 of capitalists and corporates, we then saw a new form of a, of a bilateral trading or a continental trading system being formed called the Africa Continental Free Trade, uh, Free Trade Agreement. And again, despite the fact that you might have 53 out of 54 countries maybe signing onto it, I can tell you that, they are, that the, the process to get um democracy or you know or the process towards getting that signed and the extent to which democracy allowing for civil society organizations labor um academics to really engage vociferously with what this this particular agreement ha uh, is has not happened in fact two years ago i was at a, at a meeting funded by the fes it was actually the fes plus the wto coming to talk about the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, and they had representatives from the AU and from the, the, the people pushing and working on the ACFTA. This was before it was ratified. And they were horrified when you raised key questions around whether this agreement will actually lead to fundamental transformation for us as Africans and for, for, for the majority of the people on the continent. I mean, in fact, I can guarantee you by virtue of the questions that I asked, I won't, I'm not going to be invited to, a, to, to another meeting um, because the questions are, are, are too difficult. Um, when you start engaging, why is it that civil society organizations or labor isn't in the room to be able to articulate or to, to raise the key concerns, to look at whether there are certain um, modalities, meaning the rules of engagement for the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. In fact, the, many of the modalities are not in place. But I mean, I don't want to go into the technical uh, discussions on the ACFDA. I think the main thing is 
We're just discussing what is the, F the ACFDA? Is it necessarily going to bring, bring benefits? Um, does it have um, advantages and disadvantages? And with anything, an Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is an instrument is is basically advancing trade as a tool for development. Trade mm -hmm. for tool as a development can be pos can be positive if the framework within which it's being applied is truly um, to advance development. If it's not, mm -hmm. rather than than leading to development, it would lead to further impoverishment and underdevelopment. All right, so uh, we will get into that discussion about uh, the differentiation between uh, disadvantage and uh, disadvantages and advantages of this uh, particular agreement. Uh, but thank you so much for that uh, explanation of how this uh, eventually uh, came into existence. Uh, before I get to, uh, to other aspects of this discussion and before I move on to uh, the fellow panelists as well, uh, Hamida, I just want to ask you a quick question here is, uh, is this you mentioned that there was a need for uh, an alternative economic trading system is this the alternative that uh, perhaps you were looking forward to not by a long shot and i and mm -hmm. i speak for many um trade unionists as well as um civil society organizations like third world network for example there's third world network africa there's siatini in the region um we've engaged I, from the time of the EPAs all the way through to the to the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. In fact, there's been several civil civil society meetings um, to to actually voice real concern about what the the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement could do, noting the fact that the disparity between African countries is so huge, and that if you if you continue the same framework as the as multilateral trading system which doesn't allow for true development, that doesn't look at protectionism versus liberalization as mechanisms for each country to develop, which doesn't allow for special and differential treatment. Um, I mean, even if you're talking about, um, you know, certain uh, provisions given for uh, technical barriers or non-technical barriers to trade, it's never going to be to the extent that will allow the poorest of the poor in terms of countries to be able to develop and catch up with South Africa or for, with Egypt. Or Nigeria. Right, so, yeah, uh, I, I see we've been joined by uh, Medanum Kabela as well, the founding director and CEO at uh, Ansuisa Advisory. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for joining us, uh, Miyadani. Uh, so for you, what does this, uh, this trade agreement actually mean uh, for trade and economic development uh, on the African continent? I think uh, where we need to start uh, at its uh, uh, this is this is a new uh, it's a new initiative uh, for the African Union, uh, inspired by uh, the first uh, the first and the second aspiration of Agenda 63, uh, speaking about a, a prosperous Africa based on inclusive growth and sustainable development, which is aspiration one. And aspiration two speaks about an integrated continent, uh, a politically united based on the uh, fundamentals and the vision of the African Renaissance. So these two, these two aspirations are there to shape the, uh, the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement precisely to create a single uh, market for goods and services for the, uh, you know, for the continent uh, like at large, so that whatever we produce within the continent, we are able as well to trade amongst ourselves and then we go borderless so that uh, it will be easier for whether products mm -hmm. are produced mm -hmm. at uh, mm -hmm. Angola, Nigeria, uh, Guinea-Bissau, South Africa, Egypt, Libya. But all these products, we are able to, uh, to, to participate in an inter-trade uh, whereby you know, the borders will be open for all these countries to trade amongst each other. And uh, business people will be as well allowed to move from each and every uh, uh, country to the other. And at the same time, it will as well include the movements of investment. So this is one of the greatest opportunity uh, for African, uh, uh, African entrepreneurs and African leaders as well to relieve uh, or to get a relief from other challenges that they are uh, like facing because now everyone is looking at African leaders 
uh, very less people are looking at entrepreneurs. So we really need to strike balance. And this is a solution to striking that balance where African entrepreneurs will participate in trade amongst each other and then will produce uh, African products. Mm -hmm. I think one of the key things that we need to as well depart, uh, you know, like uh, with an understanding is only when you look at agriculture, Sub-Saharan Africa uh, food import bill um, stood at around uh, 43 uh, uh, like billion uh, like US dollars. And then when you look at that, it's a very huge uh, 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 import uh, uh, like market that we are uh, taking to our country. And it is expected that by, 20, uh, by 2030, uh, that amount will be at 90 billion US dollars. And when you look on the other side, the entire import that Africa is heavy is calculated at around 540 billion US dollars. That is a very huge, uh, uh, you know, a chunk of like uh, products and services that we are importing. And if that can be produced within our country, such will assist in creating jobs, which as well, you know, like uh, this solution comes as well to uh, solve some of the societal problems. Because when business is not in order, we'll have a lot of disruptions from social, uh, so, uh, like social organizations and other things. But this is a, 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 you know, a, a strategy within the African continent to solve uh, this uh, unemployment crisis that we have, not working together as African people, uh, and you know, uh, coming in to unite us as one, uh, like one Africa. Uh, that is united to trade uh, like amongst each other. Mm -hmm. All right, if you've just joined us, you are tuned into Salah Media. This is the special focus. My name is Zahid Jadid, uh, and we are together until 9 p.m. this evening. And this evening, we are discussing the historic African Continental Free Trade Agreement uh, and what it means for Africa, for Africans as a, as a large group. Uh, you know, this, this deal, in fact, uh, impacting more than a billion people across the continent uh, from all corners of this continent. Uh, we asked our guests this evening, uh, firstly, we have Hamida Deda, who is an acting executive director at the National Labor and Economic Development Institute. Uh, we have Chris Hutting, who is a project manager at the Free Market Foundation. And we have uh, Mielanim Kabela, an economist and founding director and CEO at uh, and Suisa Transaction Advisory Services. Uh, now, just earlier on in this discussion, Hamida was speaking about uh, the disparity between African countries uh, being so different, uh, you know, uh, uh, across the continent, there, there are many differences uh, economically, culturally, uh, and Miliani also spoke about unity and uh, an integrated continent. Uh, Chris, a question for you. How much room does this allow? Uh, all these differences, uh, you know, overcoming them, how much room does this allow for an effective uh, implementation of the African Continental Free Trade Ag Agreement? I think that we should think in terms of not in terms of overcoming differences, but in allowing them to be strengthened. So, you know, each African country might have multiple strengths that they can play to uh, that are part of the cultures of the people that inhabits those particular African countries. So they need to have the freedom to utilize those strengths to their best benefit, um, to use them in whatever form of trade that the people of that particular country deem best. So I don't want us to necessarily think of um, suppressing or, uh, you know, imposing one particular, um, I guess, one view of taking the whole of Africa forward. Of course, Africa is multidimensional, multicultural, multifaceted, and very complex. And when we think of, okay, Africa needs to pursue these three things, I think we can fall into a trap of thinking that it, these three things are going to work in every single African country, in every single uh, context for every single person. So my hope with the free trade area is that it can unlock some of the rich diversity that Africa has. I mean, if you think of the history of trade throughout for centuries, it's always about different mm -hmm. people with different mm -hmm. strengths and insights coming together to trade goods and services, to solve problems, to uh, exchange their view of the world and how they're going to move forward. And I hope that the free trade area will allow those voices to sort of come to bear. I think the strength of diversity is very much amplified through trade when it's easy to trade. Of course, when there's lots of restrictions, tariffs, taxes, that kind of thing, 
then the government of a country can decide what the people should focus on and what work they should do. But when people themselves have the freedom to trade with people in their own communities, in their own cities, across borders, whether the border is next door, like South Africa with its immediate neighbors, or South Africa with Egypt or Nigeria, or indeed overseas, I think there's a lot more opportunity to utilize those strengths. So I'm hoping that the free trade area pushes in that sort of direction. Um, we have to see whether African countries, of course, implement the sorts of um, the recommendations or the requirements of the Africa free trade area. That's also a great determinant. But in general, I hope we see a rise of the kinds of things like implementing the rule of law, uh, strong property rights, um, making sure that for entrepreneurs, small businesses, they have the scope to sort of build up what they see, the needs and services that they see their communities needing the most. When we sort of defer these kinds of things to politicians or bureaucrats in a given capital, they often don't realize the strength that different communities have, and we lose sight of that. So I'm hoping we can utilize all of that in a, in a much stronger way going forward. Mm -hmm. So Chris, where does the African Continental Free Trade Agreement and this African Continental Free Trade Area uh, fall within the broader context of globalization? So I guess we have to look at, uh, you mentioned in the introduction, of course, uh, the election of President uh, Joe Biden in America now and uh, Donald Trump leaving office. So around the world, we're seeing here and there examples of some administrations and governments changing. I think after 2020 uh, and COVID-19, a lot of people around the world are very fearful of interconnectedness, of increased trade, of connectivity. We saw the exposure of value chains, of supply chains. So people are worried about what is the next pandemic going to look like and what damages is it going to cause to our lives economically, our livelihood, psychologically, spiritually? What is all of that going to entail? So I'm worried for those countries that are going to turn inwards. I don't think that's the right way forward to solve a lot of problems. I don't think that utilizes the diversity that the world has, never mind the diversity that Africa has. So there are, I think, hints of growing populism, nationalism that countries might sort of pull towards depending on what political parties are stronger in those countries. And I worry for those countries and the people who live there because inevitably they will unfortunately have a lower standard of living when countries are more open, when they have the stronger rule of law, a stronger um, government that respects rights, that can provide services for lower income individuals who are struggling. There's a sort of safety net. All of that needs a strong fiscus. It needs a strong economy for all those services to be provided. So I'm hoping that countries realize through being interconnected through trading, through pl playing to their strengths, their economies will in turn be strengthened. I don't think we should right now turn inward. Um, and just a final note um, before you know we, we hand off to the next speaker. In terms of uh, pro procuring the vaccines for COVID-19, I think it was something within a few days, a Chinese scientist uh, sequenced the virus and they, they when the Chinese government allowed them, they were allowed to share it with colleagues all around the world. And vaccines have been in very quick development in recent months. So it shows us when people are allowed to cooperate, they can solve these problems a lot, a lot faster than when we put them in these silos where we assume that people are strengthened when they're behind walls. I think we should have as few walls as possible. Mm -hmm. and so that's a really interesting and important point which you mentioned there. People are now fearing how the interconnected nature uh, of economies could be impacted in a future pandemic. Uh, so a question for you then, Hamida, is this the right time to embark on expanding this, uh, on this interdependence? Uh, Chris thinks it would be, uh, it, it, it would be, uh, it would be unwise to uh, perhaps, uh, you know, retreat from this uh, interdependence. But your thoughts on this, Hamida? Okay, so... Thanks for the question. I think it depends on what kind of interdependency you're making reference to, because, I mean, it's quite a general question. Um, mm. If you're talking about food se security or food sustainability, if countries, as a result of the, the pandemic, recognize that nutrition is absolutely important, if countries recognize that public services are exceptionally important, and rather than being dependent on private sector investment or in external investment and actually turn inwardly, look at the fiscus, look at their own resources and start developing uh, the, their public sector in order to be able to service its people in terms of water, sanitation, electricity, schools, um, ensuring that they can actually produce the necessary food internally and rather than importing uh, basic food uh, for nutrition that the, the state actually takes responsibility for that, then I would think that in actual fact, not being dependent and, and cutting interdependency in that particular um, or from that particular perspective would be a, would be a positive thing. 
I think in the in, in when you talk about interdependency in terms of well, do, should countries actually um, go into full force protectionism um, and cut themselves off uh, from 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 the global world? No, I don't think that that uh, on, on that one I would agree it's not a wise um, decision. And again, going back to the to, to the to the uh, example that Chris used in relation to the coronavirus and the and the vaccine, um, just to give you an example, Burundi charges. Four dollars for its citizens to do a COVID test. In South Africa, it's nowhere near four dollars. It's exceptionally expensive. When you go into Burundi as a as a as a foreigner, you pay a hundred dollars. Now, how is Burundi able to pay? Which, in in terms of South Africa versus Burundi, people would argue that South Africa's economy is way stronger. Now, how does a country like Burundi afford COVID nineteen tests for its citizens at four dollars? It's because it's hmm. getting the vaccine from Uganda, and Uganda is being supplied by Cipla, and Cipla is a French company who's able to supply it because of the of, of the the um, the um, West African eco, you know, the the Franco African uh, space. So therefore, the medication is able to come in at a much cheaper price. And I think using probably ECOWAS as well as other tra trade agreements within the region, they're able to do that. So of course, I think in the context of COVID. It, it is, and, and if you think again, using again Chris's example, but more specifically using China under the BRICS um, with India and China, particularly uh, being partners with countries like South Africa, sharing, engaging, what, striking agreements, even at the WTO level um, to challenge pharmaceuticals so that you actually have the development of um, local and domestic capabilities so that we can actually rather than import and talk about investment and build pharmaceutical companies that are owned externally for external exports you actually develop the capacity and competencies for the development of the vaccine in south africa so that it can become affordable and it can be available and then if you're using the existing trade agreements you can actually facilitate a process where that vaccine can be made available to the rest of the region and the continent if need be at a price that is not going to be competitive to, or in fact, way cheaper than, than the giant pharmaceuticals who are looking to make a massive buck over the, uh, over the virus. So I think it depends on the angle that one is, one is speaking to. And I think the other, the other key issue is in terms of globalization, we are exceptionally integrated. Um, but at the same time, I think we also must stop being um, um, idealistic. I mean, if you look at the issue of xenophobia in South Africa, if you look at what was happening at the Bay Bridge and in the context of coronavirus in terms of people crossing borders, if you look at what government's response was, and I think not just South Africa, but across the globe, people closed borders in the context of, of, of the coronavirus, yet we're talking about integration, regional integration, pan-Africanism, or, pa or Africa being integrated. If you also look at, if you talk about diversity and you're talking about culture, et cetera, we must know that apart from, so if you just look at it from a colonialist history, we have a large Francophone Africa and we have an Anglophone Africa. So Francophone being largely French, Anglophone being predominantly um, English speaking. Now Francophone Africa is still dominated and colonialized in my view by the French. The central, uh, the, the central Bank of France owns the economies of West Africa. 90% of the people, if, if not all of them speak French, they, they still trade in Franca and their money is, is exchanged in, 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 in euros. So the entire economy, if you look at who they, where they're importing from, um, what, I mean, it would be, if you'd be shocked if you go to West Africa, you won't find fresh milk, despite the fact that you might find cows and goats, right? Because all of their foods, processed and non-processed, come from France. So do you, I mean, even in the context of an Africa free trade, trade agreement, do you think France as a country, noting that they are dependent on West Africa in so many ways, um, to keep the economy going. You think they're just going to relinquish um, West <clears throat> Africa, Africa, continental free to carry agreement? Never. Secondly, they they trade in CEFA. If you look at how we trade, right, there's there's a particular relationship within SADC where certain SADC countries or most SADC countries can use, I mean, we, I think a couple of us actually trade or we, we're able to use our South African rand um, in some countries without having to, to exchange the, the, that into dollars. And then there's a trade-off between the two, the, the, the country that's like, for example, Namibia um, you, or Zambia, you're able to go in using South African rands. And then there's an exchange or an understanding, a particular agreement between South Africa 
and um, some of the, the study countries in, under the context of SACU, where they would, depending on what the price of the dollar is vis-a-vis -vis the rand, etc., they will know what the exchange is. Now, if you try and think about how do you integrate just on the, on the basis of currency, right, and our currencies vis-a-vis -vis the dollar into Africa, it's not going to be easy. Secondly, if you go for a common currency, and I mean, there was this whole issue, uh, people who are way more um, articulate on, on, on the financial issues and monetary sovereignty would be able to engage you um, at a more sophisticated level. But the key mm -hmm. issue is when you engage the issue of currency, just, just how do we trade? Do, we, do you think West Francophone Africa is going to accept trading in an African currency that all African countries trade, which is going to lead to a disadvantage to the French? There's, so there's, so as much as there can be commonalities and, and there are differences, some of it worked to our advantage and there are definitely differences that work to our disadvantage. And in the current context of the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, I think what they focused on is on the agreement, but not the, on the modalities of what w it would take to actually get this agreement to go into, uh, you know, to actually take uh, operation or implementation. But more importantly, who's going to gain and who's going to lose and what are the costs? I think those are some of the things that as it plays itself out. And I think, again, just in, in, in terms of your question on globalization, under globalization, noting the formation of the WTO, trade has been an absolutely fundamental instrument to facilitate development for certain countries and perpetuate underdevelopment for a majority of the world particularly those of us in the South. And I must be honest that, you know, in the current uh, trading regime, Africa specializes in poverty. Mm -hmm. and, and, and unfortunately, and yes, uh, poverty is here and uh, it's, it's a large factor uh, in Africa. It's something that's uh, quite widespread and pervasive. And unfortunately, uh, you know, it's going to take uh, quite a bit of time and effort until this, uh, this uh, issue, this challenge that is uh, poverty is eventually eradicated. And uh, Chris, uh, it, it's, it's, it's a really interesting point which you mentioned, you know, about uh, the rising nationalism, etc. Uh, so before we move on, I do want to pick up on this uh, with you, Milani. Uh, the rise in nationalism, protectionism, populism, uh, as Hamida spoke about xenophobia, borders closing in the name of COVID, how would this impact uh, the implementation of the African free trade uh, area? So the, the, the agreement is uh, precisely signed that uh, we integrate. Uh, so in integration, I think people really need to understand that uh, part of the things that uh, we are going to experience is not uh, the usual Africa that we used to uh, uh, live at, uh, but it's, a, it's a more of a new Africa that is guided by a, a united Africa or one Africa, uh, so to say. Uh, so it's not really that uh, as uh, these regions have been uh, working together or not working together, such will uh, like, like continue. I think we really need to look on this as more of an opportunity. Yes, there are challenges uh, because each and every uh, 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 creation uh, or each and every initiative can have opportunities and challenges. But I don't think uh, we'll have uh, uh, more of challenges as opposed to opportunities because this, the first thing that you need, even when you look on other trade blocks, when you look on the experience that we had recently with regard to BRICS, uh, South Africa was not trading the way it is trading now with China before BRICS, uh, and then South Africa was not trading the way it trades now with India and Brazil before BRICS. But since that, that trade block was created, we have seen tremendous changes. Challenges are there, opposition will be there. You know, uh, challenging the status quo will always give you uh, like challenges. But the opportunities you will have seen South Africa, you know, uh, uh, South Africa and China, being, uh, you know, like leading, uh, like trading partners, uh, you know, and China surpassing the United States in being the uh, biggest trading partner with South Africa. So that as well, what's, what Africa is missing or the African continent is missing is trading or is intertrade or trading amongst ourselves. 
if we when we unite that will be uh, reduced and then we'll have uh, uh, the Francophones and then we have the Anglophones starting to work uh, together. Such has started because when you look at Sentinel, uh, in each and every, uh, uh, you know, like day, you find Sentinel uh, in any side of it. You get uh, like Francophones and then you get uh, the, the Anglophones. And it's a lot of French speaking people, <coughs> French speaking uh, entrepreneurs that are at Sentinel currently, which speaks to the integration that is starting to be as well happening. So there are some of the experiences that will be guiding us in these uh, like changes. But yes, we need to look uh, deeper more on what are the benefits of this, because one of the key benefits is to enhance competitiveness at the uh, industry level and in, like enterprise level. And that will have to be inspired by you know, uh, uh, African prioritizing in uh, intellectual property rights of manufacturing products and um, other material products uh, where, you, you know, like our, our leading, uh, like, uh, uh, like exporters to Africa, which is China, France, United States, Germany, and India, they are playing at that space. And we really need to have those uh, uh, products being produced in Africa, such will need us to be competitive to a particular degree. As to uh, the difficulties of how Africa will struggle to work together, I mean, that we really need to uh, come up with more campaigns and uh, society, you know, like all these community organizations and social organizations will really need to work with the business fraternity as well and the government in making sure that they galv galvanize people or mobilize more people to start to work together. People will need to be trained because Anglophones are not used to work with uh, Francophones now. Uh, you find the people from Anglophones, they don't understand French, and then the, um, the, the, the French-speaking people as well, they don't understand English. So it's, it's a lot of other things that like are happening, but you really need to look at how do you move these barriers what mm. what set of marketing strategies uh, that you are going to employ in the system to you know reduce these barriers and make sure that you encourage all these people to work together this will as well need leaders that will inspire the continent you really need uh, uh, you know african leaders that will be pillars of this uh, like region to unite africa and it's the responsibility of young people mainly you know like when young people unite africa will unite so young people are ma in majority in africa if we start as young people and youth uh, to unite all these people that are old will, will 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 come together as well we are you know like as young people what we need to do is start to learn the cultures of each and every uh, countries that we will be trading uh, like with we need to know that there is Begno Faso. We need to know that there, there is uh, Guinea-Bissau and guinea Conigri. And then we need to relate and network with all those people. So in our WhatsApp groups, in our uh, uh, all social uh, like media like uh, groups, LinkedIn, we need to relate with African people. And that will start to be a way of uh, us working together because we can't really just integrate the continent while us as individuals who are not integrated. We really need to have these integrations in all levels, and that will be assisting. The issues of now that, uh, you know, like whatever we're seeing at Bad Bridge, uh, the things that like Africa or like South Africa is considered not working with other African countries, that is, uh, I will say, it's uh, like it's a, like it's a, it's a, it's a mean. It needs to be trained. People need to be trained, and each and every country has rules. We, we really have our national rules. We have our uh, continental rules. So we are uniting now, and we need to focus on building on that unity and not reminding people on the fights that has been happening in Africa, because all these dissertations of reminding people of what happened in the past is not going to assist Africa. The, the global community is taking so much from Africa and that need us to unite all. You know, it's one of the critical aspects that Africa needs to unite in what 
all these global economies or these developed economies are taking from Africa and leave Africa with nothing. That is something that we need to unite, uh, you know, like around, and we need to galvanize all the African leaders to unite as well. From the Pan African Parliament, African leaders need to unite, and whatever is happening in the African, in the Pan African uh, like Parliament, it needs to stop. These things of only, you know, uh, you know, the francophones voting each other, the anglophones voting each other, all those things need to stop. And then we need to look at a united Africa. The 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 uh, the African Union as well, you know, it has a very good structure of uh, a chairperson and uh, uh, you know the chairperson of African Union being changed each and every year. While we have the CEO of African Union being uh, changing every four years, such things need to happen as well in your Africa Development Bank and in your uh, Pan African uh, like Parliament, and that will assist in uniting Africa because we really need to come up with you know um, rules in making sure that there is one strategic vision and we have policies and regulations that will enable this uh, regional integration so that investors, entrepreneurs and social uh, society organizations will be mobilized and work together uh, uh, mm -hmm. you know, in that unity for one Africa. All right. Uh, so it is 49 minutes past 8 p.m. Central African time, and we are going to have to begin wrapping up uh, this discussion around the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. Uh, and I must say it's been an interesting discussion so far. And uh, uh, so one of the issues which we've uh, come across and we've highlighted in this discussion is that unity is a critical aspect and galvanizing leaders to unite is something that's uh, really important, as uh, Milanem Kabela just mentioned uh, uh, earlier on in his response to my previous question. And I I see a few comments also coming from uh, from the listeners. Uh, we will take a look at some of those comments in a short while, uh, and please do keep them coming in via our WhatsApp line. That's zero six one seven double six zero three double five. Alternatively, you can leave your comment uh, below our Facebook and YouTube uh, broadcasts. Uh, now, Chris, moving over to you. Uh, We've we've discussed about the uh, Francophone nations and uh, Anglophone nations, the differences between uh, uh, the North Africa and uh, the northern regions of Africa and the southern regions of Africa. Uh, and one of the questions which then arises is, uh, are these nations, uh, in particular the Francophone nations, which are still very largely dependent on their colonizers on France, for example, uh, as Hamida earlier on uh, mentioned, uh, are these nations willing to at least reduce their dependence on France, uh, you know, for the benefit of the rest of Africa to now come and collaborate uh, with the rest of Africa, uh, you know, leaving behind some of the colonial legacy that uh, has, uh, you know, dominated uh, the way they deal uh, in their region and with the rest of Africa? Chris? So I think it's a, it might be a case of a sort of uh, this might be a bit reductionist, but a bit of a cost uh, cost benefit analysis. So I won't presume to speak on behalf of, on behalf of any of those governments. But for example, if the people of a particular country are very concerned about supply chain vulnerability, then one could you could appeal to to the part of if you manage to bring in manufacturing into your own country, make it more robust, have value to other countries trading with you, your country is going to be better off. So I think it's appealing to people's sort of economic and well-being, standard of life, self-interest. You have to make sure that you, you explain to them why aspects of increased trade will be to their benefit and intra-African trade. So for, for example, the Africa Free Trade Area aims to, you know, this isn't to say that it will, but it aims to eliminate import tariffs on 90%, uh, 97% of the goods traded on the African content, continent itself over the next few years. So if you think of the radical power that that could have for people's everyday lives, you know, you just have to try and capture the, I guess, the abstract part of trade that it's always supposed to be win-win, that I'm trying to get a benefit for something that I think is of lesser worth. For example, if I buy a laptop, that costs a thousand rand. I think the laptop is worth more than a thousand rand to me, so I'm gaining more value. It's the same with any other good or service. You try and appeal to that part of of people's worldview that engaging in trading of goods and services with other people, whether it's the immediate neighbor, whether it's someone in a city uh, 200 kilometers away, whether it's someone in a city on the other side of the continent, it it should be to their benefit, and they should look for those aspects that 
that enhance that kind of thing. I don't think we should necessarily um, come in with a blunt hammer, a blunt tool kind of thing and say, you will trade with this country or that country. Each African country, I suppose, has to, has to decide for itself through its government, through its leaders. I also don't know if we should necessarily wait for political leaders to sort of lead this kind of thing. I think we focus too much on personalities and then when they let us down, we're in, incredibly disappointed. The focus should be on on individual agency, dignity, action, that kind of thing. Communities, what communities, business groups, civil society, um, what they can do, what those people know the biggest challenges are in their communities, not necessarily uh, the president of a country or something like that. Not to say that stakeholders don't have a role to play, but I think we should shift our locus of sort of focus and control to people on the ground. Um, it shouldn't necessarily come be coming all from uh, elected officials and that kind of thing. So I guess to sum up, uh, that's my broad view on the the sort of appealing to to people's self interest around trade. I think we need to make it as appealing as possible. And to highlight what my my co panelists have said, um, you know, you need to you need to look at the historical context and then break some of those chains and dependency. Um, France, to take one example now with the francophone countries, France might push back very hard on some things, and then African countries simply have to push back and decide. This is to their benefit. They can trade with other countries. Um, they can tell France, you know, for example, this is not this is not on. These are our resources. Um, these are our people, our personnel. These are this is our time. So, on what terms are we going to do a win-win here? Trade shouldn't be a lose-win or lose-lose kind of thing. So, I think that's broadly my my view on that sort of challenge. Mm. And we have just about six minutes remaining before 9 p.m., which is uh, basically when the show ends. And uh, I think there's much more scope for this discussion to continue even off air. Uh, but as we begin ra wrapping up, I want to just quickly read a comment which comes uh, from a Facebook user, uh, Afzal Nur Mohammed. So he says, how will you solve the unemployment problem if you are serving your former colonial masters who exploit the resources and people for the benefits of the so-called first world? Uh, will the free trade agreement benefit people at grassroots level? Unlikely. So I think, Afzal, this is the thing. Uh, this entire agreement, perhaps, uh, one of the main aspects of it is perhaps to, you know, move away from the colonial le legacy which has dominated our lives as Africans uh, for quite a long time, perhaps for decades. Uh, and I think that's exactly what uh, this, uh, this this trade agreement uh, aims to do. But that's when we are hearing from, uh, you know, politicians. And uh, that's why we have to analyze what's being said. And that's why we have this panel discussion this evening. Uh, so I'm just going to give the panelists uh, about a minute each to, you know, wrap up uh, their final thoughts. Uh, and with the question, uh, who stands to benefit, who stands to gain, and who stands to lose uh, from this uh, trade deal? Uh, you can begin first, Hamida, and then uh, over to uh, Miyadani, and then finally, Chris. Thanks very much. I just want to qualify something. So the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, as I mentioned, um, was also born out of the EPAs, which is which was pushed by the European countries. So, and, and when, you, when we needed, um, when African countries and leaders needed uh, trade facilitation, they needed support to understand what the Africa Continental Free Trade, free trade Agreement was and when they needed support and um, um, capacity building, it was done by the EU. So let's, let's not say that the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is here to challenge colonialism. For those of us who have looked at, the, at, at what the details of the Africa Continental Free Trade Ag Re Agreement is and what it's trying to achieve, it's using Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement in the same way that you had the Free Trade Agreement of the Americas. It's using exactly that to make it sound like it's for Africa, but in actual fact, it's doing, it's perpetuating what has historically been. If you go to the, 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 the issue of, of, of agency, I mean, there's, do, you, do you honestly think that the Francophone African countries, if they had the power to make a decision for independence and relinquish the hold that the, Frank, that the French government has over them, that they wouldn't have done that out of their own? You don't need an African mm -hmm. Africa continental free trade agreement to get the Frank, of, you know, to, to, to change that. They would have done it if they had the ability to. The, to in Togo, the, 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 as much as the, 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 the president is exceptionally um, autocratic and he's also um, in some ways quite, uh, 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 you know, he's, he's, he's part of the military, he uses brutal force in many instances, People can't articulate uh, dis uh, dissonance.
he actually tried to go towards um, the Middle East, um, looking at the, the UAE and, and uh, Kuwait and, and Dubai except, and, and Saudi as, as trading partners, and he really got a whopping. I mean, his entire port is now owned by, I think, the, the, the Prime Minister of, or the President of France. So, I mean, we need to be really realistic, right? There are a lot mm -hmm. of things that we, if, if the world was equal and, there was, and the powers that be were equal, then the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, with all due respect to my brother, um, uh, you know, it, all of those aspects that you make reference to, uh, uh, I can't remember the, the, uh, the brother's name from, the, from, from this Enterprise Institute. I mean, it would really be exactly what you're what, what you identifying as the aspirations. The problem is the framework. The framework, unfortunately, is not Pan-African. It does not speak to Pan-Africanism and, re and true regional integration in the way that we need it to in order to deliver the key aspirations which you, are, which you allude to. In fact, I agree with you 100%. It's just that the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement in its current form will no not deliver. And where I want to agree with Chris, absolutely, leaders come and go. It's the people who are the agency. So it is the African people who, once we unite as an African continent, recognize that we are one and truly... Um, put into practice our principles of Ubuntu, we will inevitably find ourselves trading with each other without any trade agreement need, uh, needing to be implemented by an external force. Thanks. All right. Thank you so much for that, Amida. Uh, over to you, Milan uh, Kabela, to finalize your thoughts on this. Yeah, um, the Africa uh, Continental Free Trade Agreement comes at a very good time when we have a global material resources uh, outlook uh, that uh, speaks to uh, the material uh, resources boom uh, for 2060. So that will give the African continent a very huge advantage. And when we unite amongst ourselves as a continent and we start to uh, trade amongst ourselves, we manufacture uh, products and services, and we as well dress our own, uh, you know, like all these brands uh, like that are there, like international, we need to replace those brands. So the textile industry, we really need to replace that and make sure that like we, we, we you know, like we can start to symbolize this Africa free trade agreement in dressing our national teams. And then uh, looking at that, we have a lot of national teams. So we have about 54 national teams that can get into that. But moving into the key drivers, you know, you need to look on economic drivers, uh, which are like mainly agriculture, uh, recycling or circular economy in its uh, like actual name. Uh, you need to look on construction because uh, infrastructure development and industrialization will be on the lead. And then the services industry uh, and then like industry like at, at large. So all those aspects must as well align with the environmental, like uh, uh, like uh, uh, in the in environmental setups, or you know, comply with the circular economy, or there must be circularity uh, in all the products and safety, in all the products that must be produced. So I think that is one of the key things that we need to look at, and then we need to unite African youth from now. And when we speak, because the ways that we speak, they affect society. So when we speak, we need to start speaking unity. And when we start speaking unity, our youth will learn to work together if the older people have failed to work together. And that will make us to have a good continent in the future. This is the legacy that we need to build for African youth. And we, we don't have to be selfish about it. We need to leave this continent in a very good hands with the young people. And we need to, you know, a, a hand over a very good economy that they will flourish as well as young people and be, pr be proud of their own economy. I think that is the responsibility for all of us as uh, uh, mature people who are uh, uh, 35 years and older. We need to unite the continent and it is our responsibility. From now on, that is the message that needs to be spread all over. The history that has happened is not really going to assist whether South Africa and Nigeria are competing. Such is not important. What is important is how can we know Lagos better? How can Lagos know Lagos community, know Sentin as well? So we need to understand our cultures and we come together. We are one as Africa. We have one mm. African union. 
and we have one African Development Bank. And from that level, we really need to move uh, with uh, the vision uh, of the African uh, Union and Agenda 63. Uh, unity in Africa must be the first pillar guiding each and every speech that we do. All right, thank you so much, Milani, for that. Uh, we are just three minutes uh, past 9 p.m. Central African time, and uh, I'm going to have to give uh, Chris a final opportunity to wrap up on his thoughts uh, for this evening. Chris? Uh, thank you, Zahid. I want to support what Milani said about sort of the African youth taking it forward, and then what I think is very important for, for people to keep in mind what Hamedas has said about the context of the free trade uh, agreement and the, the sort of space in which it was formed and the, the serious challenges that still remain. So in terms of the impact that it can have on, on people on the grassroots level, I'm obviously hoping that it'll have a very positive, uh, radically transformative impact. Um, but we, we have to see how governments implement the sort of aspects of it, the recommendations of the free trade area. So I'm hopeful. I think it's a better sign than things we've seen in the past. Um, and for that, I'm, I'm grateful uh, after a pandemic we need as much things to hold on to as possible. And that might not always be realistic. We have to be very realistic in terms of these things and not get carried away. But I'm, I'm hoping for the best. So I think I'll, I'll wrap up on that note and, and thank you very much for the opportunity. All right. Thank you so much for uh, your input to each one of the panelists this evening. I must say it's been an interesting discussion uh, since about uh, 10 past eight this evening. And uh, uh, just to give a brief wrap up of what we've been discussing over uh, this, uh, the, the course of the last hour or so. Uh, so we've been discussing the African continental free trade area, the African continental free trade agreement, uh, its context and its benefits, its disadvantages. So uh, if one was to look at uh, some of the uh, advantages which have been highlighted over the course of this discussion, uh, we see that uh, the, the the agreement has the potential to become a, a game changer and bring some opportunities, uh, like improving the intra-African trade landscape and export structure, creating a, glo a sound global economic impact. Uh, you know, developing better policy frameworks, fostering specialization and boosting uh, industrialization. Uh, these are some of the advantages which uh, one could attribute to the trade agreement. But at the same time, uh, as with many things, there are certain disadvantages and two particular disadvantages uh, arising from the, uh, the agreement could include uh, potential increase in the outsourcing of jobs as a result of uh, the significantly reduced tariffs uh, and the possible degradation of natural resources. Uh, that's just a further analysis from uh, uh, other experts uh, uh, through my research that I've conducted. But it's been an interesting discussion this evening. Uh, what the guests have said this evening, so to wrap up what, uh, what our guests have uh, said this evening, uh, from Hamida, I, I see a uh, certain bit of uh, skepticism, uh, especially uh, as she sees it in the context of how this agreement came into effect. And, uh, you know, mentioning that Europe is uh, using the agreement to perpetuate what has been taking place uh, historically, uh, you know, she mentioned that the framework might not be exactly uh, pan-African. Uh, for me, Alani Kabela, it's good timing. The African continent uh, will have an advantage. Uh, and, you know, he speaks about uniting the youth. And uh, I agree with that because uh, the youth, in fact, 60% uh, uh, of the African uh, population uh, across the continent uh, is under the age of 25. So uh, major role players in uh, the economy, culture, etc., of uh, the continent and to wrap up what Chris also says, uh, you know, speaking about uh, the benefits which might uh, come across, uh, Chris saying it's a, a step in the a positive step in the right direction. Uh, but of course, it's up to communities uh, at the end of the day. Uh, but that's where we're going to have to leave it for this evening. Thank you so much to each one of the panelists for your time this evening and your contribution as well. Uh, much appreciated. And to the listeners and those of you who've sent your uh, comments and questions, your input, uh, thank you so much for that as well. Uh, the show is nothing really without uh, the audience. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us this evening. We'll do it again next week, same time, same place. Please do stay, stay tuned with Salah Media.